Hello and welcome to today's uh, continuation of our series of the IU Grand Challenges projects today, focusing on prepared for environmental change. And our specific topic is the social dimensions of climate change. Um, I'm Fred Kay, I'm Vice President for Research, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be joined by so many of my distinguished colleagues here today who are going to bring a lot of different perspectives to this broad topic of the social dimensions of climate change. I thought rather than me make a lot of opening remarks, since we have a large group of panelists today and we have a, a limited amount of time, it would be probably more useful to just jump right in. And I would like to ask them in um, order, I'm gonna do this in order, to first say a quick word of introduction so you know what makes them so interesting. And then a bit about what are they doing as part of the uh, Prepared for Environmental Change uh, Grand Challenge. And so we'll start with Elizabeth uh, Grennan Browning. Lizzie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fred. Um, and thanks for that welcome and everyone for being here today. Um, to give you a sense of my research and how I've been involved um, with the Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge. Um, I'm a US historian and I specialize in environmental history, intellectual history, the history of race and ethnicity and the history of labor and American capitalism since the 19th century. Uh, and while history is my home discipline and the main way that I approach various research questions, I always endeavor to integrate environmental history with other related fields, including political ecology and environmental justice scholarship, and in order to offer a deeper understanding of environmental health inequities and environmental racism in the United States, and particularly in the Midwest. So my research and publications have spanned a wide breadth of environments and temporal frameworks everything from progressive era urban planning and design to mid 20th century urban renewal to late 19th or late 20th century uh, Midwestern monoculture and pesticide usage. And throughout the various different subjects of my historical research, whether it pertains to urban or rural spaces, my primary goal is really to tell stories that illuminate the surprising ways in which environmental thought and valuations of the environment enter into the always contentious deliberations that Americans have waged over civic belonging and civic protections. Um, so I have a forthcoming book titled Nature's Laboratory, Environmental Thought in Chicago's Fight Against Labor Radicalism, 1871 to 1937, which I am submitting to my editor in a, a few days. Um, and that'll be published in the fall of 2022 with Johns Hopkins University Press. And the book is really it's an environmental and intellectual history of Chicago that analyzes how reformers and intellectuals strategically drew on environmental thought from developments in ecology and conservation in order to better understand labor radicalism, labor unrest, and the relationship between labor and capital during the nation's transition to modern industrial capitalism. And questions from this first book kind of merged with my research here at IU during my fellowship. Um, I should have mentioned that I am a, a research fellow with the Environmental Resilience Institute. I'm the, the history fellow. Um, and so my research here has really um, brought forward this new interest in the intellectual evolution of social control and social reform theories to focus on the history of mass incarceration in the United States as it relates to histories of environmental remediation, restoration ecology, environmental racism, and climate justice. So my methodologies as a historian Primarily, you know, I conduct my work through archival, archival research, but in my time here at the Environmental Resilience Institute, I've had the opportunity um, to develop new methodologies, including oral history and public history and public humanities work, which has been really exciting um, and critical to my methodological approach to public history and public humanities is community engaged research that draws on a decolonial approach with deep respect for the community's diverse values, cultures, and ways of knowing. So I, I try to look at critical indigenous and feminist epistemologies and see them as really imperative for building complex, fuller understandings of the community's history. And I'll be happy to talk about my public history work at the Environmental Resilience Institute in greater detail as we continue our discussion today. Um, in particular, I'm gonna be talking about um, um, an exhibition um, that was a collaboration among historians and artists and curators um, about the Anthropocene here in the Midwest in Indiana. So with that, I will um, return to you, Fred. Thank you very much, Lizzie. I really appreciate it. I've got a lot of questions already. We we'll turn now to Nathan Geiger from the Media School. Nathan? 
Hi. Yeah, it's great to it's great to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm an assistant professor of communication science here at IU, uh, associated with the media school, and I'm also affiliated with the Environmental Resilience Institute. And so my work, um, I am a social scientist uh, with training actually as a social psychologist, focusing primarily on doing um, survey studies and experimental study messaging studies to understand how people relate to climate change. And so my work primarily focuses on trying to understand how people think and feel about climate change uh, with a focus on understanding how people can become empowered to become more engaged with the topic and engage how they also how they can engage more effectively with climate change. Um, I work to understand barriers to public engagement with this topic and how they can be overcome. And in particular, um, a lot of my work focuses on trying to understand the links between individual perceptions and engagement. So sort of going back to my background as, as a psychologist, as a social psychologist, um, it's trying to, trying to understand how the relationship between people and society. And so it's trying to understand how people relate to climate change um, at the individual level, but how that um, interacts with the how we relate to climate change as a social phenomenon. And most recently, um, some of my work that I'll be talking a little bit about today is a project uh, where we were looking at um, the more recent uh, COVID-19 crisis and some of the overlaps between the COVID-19 crisis and climate change, what we can learn from that and what we can take away from that to better inform action on both issues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nathan, I look forward to actually hearing more about that, but let me go ahead and get uh, Matt Hauser in. Uh, Matt's an environmental sociologist, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, tough acts to follow. One wonderful introduction so far. Very excited to be here. I am an environmental sociologist by training. <clears throat> I'm now with the Nature Conservancy and the University of Maryland Horn Point Laboratory. I work as an applied social scientist there, uh, but I just recently moved on and I was very sad to leave Indiana University and the Environmental Resilience Institute. While I was there, I was the community studies fellow and um, just loved my time there. And part of the reason I loved my time there was it gelled really well with the type of work I do. So while I'm a sort of environmental social scientist by training, uh, I would say the only type of work I do is, is team-based, is interdisciplinary. It's focused on understanding how the natural world and the social world collide by working uh, <clears throat> not only with natural scientists and other social scientists and, and historians like Eric and Lizzie, who I've both collaborated with, but also with, with the public, with stakeholders, getting their input and having that shape my work and ensuring that that work makes it back out to those public uh, and the stakeholders and that it informs their behavior. So I, I'm doing that now at the Nature Conservancy, but really the roots of that work began with the Environmental Resilience Institute and the very grounded implementation focused um, projects that were encouraged and, and really fundamental and made that institute unique and, and one of the reasons I liked it so much. I was fortunate to work on a variety of projects while I was at IU, um, including a National Science Foundation funded project uh, where we're currently still working with farmers to understand their drought decision making. Lizzie is a collaborator on that project. And Eric and I uh, also were both co-leads on the Hoosier Life Survey and the Hoosier Life Survey 2.0, which gels very well with some of uh, Nathan's uh, recent work where we were trying to understand how 2020 generally kind of impacted Hoosier's views around climate change and adaptation. Uh, building on our initial Hoosier Life survey. So I'm very excited to, to be here and to continue to talk with you all. Super, thank you very much. So are you in Washington now or Maryland or? Yeah, I'm on the Eastern shore, the Delmarva Peninsula. We're uh, east in Maryland. Uh, we're right along the Chesapeake Bay and we're like an hour and a half outside of DC. Okay, I'm not gonna feel sorry for you one little bit then. <laughs> um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Kelly who, Jason, I think I always ask you this question. Is this really your library behind you or is this a picture of somebody else's library? It, it really is my library. And you can tell because the book pile just keeps getting bigger each week as the semester it, goes on. It's really yeah. impressive. I mean, that that pile is something. And does the library ever want its books back or or, or do they know you have them? Or? You know, the embarrassing thing is uh, my office at school has the library books. So I'm kind of- These are yours. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Well, for people who think that the role of publishing is decreasing, remember, thank Jason Kelly, it's doing alive and well. Please introduce yourself. Thanks so much, Fred. Uh, I'm Jason Kelly. I am a professor of history here at IUPUI. I'm actually also the chair of the department. Uh, I'm also the director of the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute. So this is an institute at IUPUI uh, that brings together arts and humanities uh, scholarship across campus. So we get to work with all of the units across campus. Uh, my research, uh, Histori you know, I was trained as an 18th century or historian of the 18th century, spe specifically British history. And I continue to be very interested in the 18th century, specifically at where art, science, and society intersect with each other. Uh, but my, my scholarship has continued to evolve since I've been uh, at IU and IUPY. And uh, I increasingly have focused on um, uh, interdisciplinary approaches to the environment. Uh, and actually, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm working on a monograph on the history of the Anthropocene, uh, which emerges from uh, about a decade of work I've been doing with scholars across the globe. Um, I also direct a series of research projects as part of my research agenda. Uh, one of these is the Anthropocene's Network, which has been around for the last uh, 11 years or so uh, here at IUPUI. It's a transdisciplinary research project with several sub-projects, one of which is the Anthropocene Household. And this is uh, the, the Grand Challenges project that I've been working on with a number of scholars, uh, including Gabe Filippelli, who's uh, very deeply involved in this project. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing together today. Um, a second project uh, that I direct is the Cultural Ecologies Project, which looks at how cultural interventions transform cities. So this is a public scholarship project. Uh, we work with a lot of community organizations and we've been working on a multi-year project right now, which is looking at equity in the arts here in central Indiana. And then finally, um, I also uh, direct the COVID-19 Oral History Project, uh, which is, uh, as it sounds, an oral history project attempting to uh, uh, catalog the experiences that people have had over the course of, of COVID-19 and actually better understand what the longer term implications are in their lives. So this is a longitudinal study uh, that's gonna continue for, for years out into the future. Um, thank you. And Anthropocene referring to the age in which we're, in which humans have been active on earth, is that is that an oversimplification? Uh, no, um, there's a number of definitions for the Anthropocene. I'll give you the probably the easiest, uh, the, the, the geological uh, uh, definition of the Anthropocene, which is basically the idea that humans have transformed the globe and the Earth system so much that we've left a traceable layer in the Earth's stratigraphy, so that if we disappeared tomorrow, um, uh, alien archaeologists could come here 20,000 years from now and see how we've transformed the planetary system. So the, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, phosphorus, nitrogen, et cetera. That's the, the quick elevator pitch of the Anthropocene. Okay, great. Well done. <laughs> um, and then um, Eric Sandweiss. Eric. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Fred. Uh, again, uh, my name is Eric Sandweiss. I am a professor of history here at Indiana University at Bloomington and delighted to be a part of this discussion. My background is um, distinguished, I suppose, by both the content and, and the outcome of how historians work in terms of the content. I've always uh, been a historian of architecture and cities and the built environment and working out from that any kind of shaped landscape. In terms of the outcome, what that interest produces in addition to uh, traditional works of scholarship, I'm also interested in teaching, studying, and then pursuing myself uh, unusual forms or uh, untraditional forms of thinking historically, that is outside of the classroom, outside of the, the traditional uh, scholarly monograph. And so that's uh, what got me started on a career in museums and public history before coming to IU. It's uh, what motivated me in many years uh, since arriving at Bloomington in uh, editing a journal called the Indiana Magazine of History, which has a a wide readership that we're proud of. 
And finally, it's what motivated me to uh, get involved uh, early on with the proposal for a grand challenge that was then uh, entitled Prepared for Environmental Change. And that uh, was ultimately successful and resulted in the Environmental Resilience Institute, of which I was uh, one of the original board members. So uh, it's really great to see my colleagues here who have come on board since that time to see uh, Vice President Kate and uh, in general to kind of reflect on where we've been over the last couple of years as we're planning to do in this session. Super, Eric, thank you. And we're also joined by Sarah Mincy, who is a, a professor in the O'Neill School of um, Public and Environmental Affairs and also uh, one of the co-directors of the Environmental Resilience Institute. We agreed earlier before the rest of you were let in that she's the adult supervision for us today, but she'll also be uh, taking your questions. So if you have questions, I don't mean she has to answer them all, although I think that would be fine with all of us if you wanna answer them. But if you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A and then Sarah will pull them out and make sure that we get to all of them. And if we, for some reason, run out of time, we'll get to the rest of them in writing, I, 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 I promise you. Um, but I think the big question that everybody wants to know, and I certainly want to know, is, you know, what are you learning from your research? Like, what's, what's interesting? What's surprising? What should we care about? So um, I know that's a huge question to ask an academic, and then to ask you to be brief in your answer is, like, just downright unfair. But, but on the other hand, what is it you're learning? We have such talent here in such interesting, diverse, but also somewhat overlapping areas. So again, you can go in any order you want. I don't, I don't, I don't want to just keep doing it alphabetically. That's not fair to Lizzie, and, and um, nor is it fair to Eric. Fair to Eric because everything will get taken first. What's something we should know about that you've discovered from your work today? I'll hit you with a, a top of line finding from the Hoosier Life Survey. Super. So just. Um, just to make sure everyone's familiar, this was a statewide survey that went out to every, you know, 15,000 households in, in Indiana. Um, we are able to talk very accurately about how Hoosiers at the state level think and feel about climate change based on our results. Um, you know, we had wonderful response rates uh, and, you know, ultimately it was, a, it was a great project. But one of the things we really found that is that we had higher levels of supportive views and acknowledgement of climate change than we would have originally thought. Um, upwards of, of potentially 80% of Hoosiers on this survey reported that they believed that humans played at least somewhat, uh, some role in causing climate change, even if they weren't the dominant factor. And this was, this was rather shocking to us and not suggested by prior surveys that use estimation-based methods to understand state-level views on climate change. And so it really suggested the value of doing this work, of being grounded in the state, being grounded in the Midwest, and asking people what they felt rather than, you know, sort of guesstimating. I'll also say that, you know, Hoosiers um, were, were subject to some of the political divisions we see generally across the country, and specifically whenever it comes to co uh, topics like climate change. We saw that Democrats and Republicans felt very differently about this topic whenever we asked about the problem. But the real insight for me came whenever we started asking about policies that could address climate related risks. Here we saw that regardless of how you identified politically, in general, the majority of people supported climate policy at the local level. And what was maybe really surprising is that whenever we posed hypothetical tax situations to pay for that local climate policy, the vast majority of people, regardless of their political party, supported implementing those taxes. And so what it really suggests broadly to me is if we can move past some of the discussions about the problem, the contentious topics, and begin with discussions about the solution and how we achieve those solutions, that's a way forward around the topic of environmental change and ultimately towards achieving resilience. And I'll note that uh, while our, sur our survey can uh, confirm this, this was a message that Janet McCabe was preaching and practicing whenever she was leading the Environmental Resilience Institute as well. 
And, and so we're fortunate that we saw that happening and that um, we have the evidence that feels like it can support that as a strategy broadly. Super, okay, that's good news. Can someone top that? I wanna jump in actually, because I think this is actually a great, a great connection to some of our work that we've done recently. Um, and I'm glad that you guys found, um, you guys found similar things at the state level because we definitely, I think in terms of the methodology, um, it sounds like your methodology was superior to actually get at what uh, Indiana residents specifically found. Um, we did do some estimation stuff, uh, but we were also interested in looking at whether this phenomenon is scalable up at the national level. So what we did was, um, I think our recent work was pretty complementary actually to what, um, what Matt was just talking about because what we were looking at was um, not people's, own opinions about climate change. We were looking at people's perceptions of others' opinions about climate change. And what we found uh, surprised us a little bit. So we, we had reason to think people might be a little off about other people's opinions, other people's support for policies, but the sheer amount that people were off was, um, was really interesting and surprising to us. So we estimated, and not surprisingly, um, if you hadn't just heard uh, Matt talk about this, um, you might estimate, you know, similar to what the average person in our survey estimated. Uh, the average person in our survey estimated that most of the four policies we asked about, um, things like anything like from a carbon tax to the Green New Deal to um, citing renewable energy on public lands, they tended to think that those policies had about 40 to 60% of support. They thought that citing renewable energy on public lands was a bit more popular, but they thought that the other two, the other three policies we studied um, were going to be less than 50% support. And we found that across all the policies, whatever the actual support was, people were underestimating on average by about 25 percentage points. So the Green New Deal actually had about two thirds of Americans support the Green New Deal. And people estimated on average that only about 40% um, supported it. And that was similar for a carbon tax. Uh, the carbon tax specifically policy that we asked about was a revenue neutral carbon tax. So it'd be a carbon tax where there's a tax on carbon and then everybody gets a rebate back um, sort of equal to the proceeds of that. But that was also quite popular and people didn't think that would be very popular. So we found the average underestimation was about 25 percentage points. People in the U.S. as a whole thought that um, most other Americans did not support these when in reality about two thirds of Americans did. The renewable energy on public land, that one actually had about 80% support. People estimated about 60%. So they were also pretty far off on that. And when we asked people in Indiana, um, what do you think other people in your state think? They were similarly pretty far off. They estimated, um, you know, even lower. They were, in some cases, you know, they might say oh, only 25% of Hoosiers support this policy when it might have been above 50% for some of them. And so this is really suggesting that there's this huge barrier between, you know, a lot of these things are actually quite popular having majority support or in some cases even two thirds or more support. But people are thinking, oh, like, I'm really one of the few people who supports this. This doesn't seem very popular. And so we were really, we found this really interesting just how far off people were. The fact that 90% of people underestimated other support. And we really wanna follow up on understanding that in more detail. So let me ask if I may, my other question is still alive. I'm very anxious to hear about your other surprising discoveries, but particularly after this comment from, from Nathan and, and, and from Matthew, why does the political debate seem so shrill if in fact there's some underlying consensus around this? And I gather, um, particularly, uh, Lizzie, I go back to what you said at the very beginning about a, an always contentious dialogue. Um, you weren't talking just about the environment, but um, do you know? I mean, does our research tell us anything about why this is such seems like such a divisive issue if in fact the public has a fair amount of, of uh, commonality on at least some elements of it? Right, that's a great question and one that I hope others will chime in on, uh, especially for contemporary relevance. The sociologists, social scientists will um, probably have more insight than I will as the historian, but um, What's striking for me, listening to Matt and Nathan um, about you know these unexpected kind of surprising levels of support for understanding climate change and actions that people are willing to take, um, is that we're just not talking with each other. We're not talking with our neighbors or community members. This is where the disconnect is happening. Um, and so, as a historian, I, I'm you know learning about the kinds of research that others were doing at the Environmental Resilience Institute. I wanted to create 
spaces for the public in Indiana um, to come together and have the opportunity to see the state of Indiana in a new way. And that's really what um, the exhibition that I mentioned at the beginning, um, Hoosier Lifelines, Environmental and Social Change Along the Monon, um, which um, looked at the Monon Railroad, um, which began here in Indiana in 1847, um, and the ways that the Monon Railroad affected the landscape, created um, opportunities for industry and community <laughs> to thrive um, in Indiana. But at the same time, it also laid the groundwork for um, the types of things that Jason was talking with the Anthropocene, the kind of um, incredible changes that um, humans have um, had on our landscape. But um, to give you an example in the exhibit, um, uh, new ways of seeing a familiar landscape. We had these maps of the Monon Railroad, um, which ran from New Albany in the south, the Ohio River Valley, up through Michigan City on the dunes of Lake Michigan. Um, so we were trying to, you know, methodologically just tie this really vast, diverse landscape together in one place. Um, but at the same time, um, we had a map um, from the Miami people of um, Indiana, Illinois, um, and we had maps of the Underground Railroad um, that, you know, the history of that is connected to the, um, the Monon Railroad in Indiana. So um, having people understand that the types of mobility, the types of opportunities presented by the Monon Railroad was not universal for everyone um, in, in this story of, of the railroad here in Indiana. So I think, again, that trying to create creative spaces for people to rethink a really familiar place is important for um, having constructive conversations about climate change moving forward. I would add to, to Lizzie's comment, if I might, uh, just quickly, Please. in this question about why the misunderstanding of, uh, of public support, public consensus, public willingness, uh, in part, uh, at least according to the people that we talk to across 90 out of 92 counties in this state, uh, in part, it's because they don't perceive themselves necessarily as part of the public. There is a, a strong, not unique, but, but, but strongly Hoosier characteristic of identifying with one's self, one's uh, family, and to some lesser extent to a surrounding community. And we found that again and again, when we asked people to identify themselves, for instance, you know, in choosing any words they want, it was always about personal characteristics and always positive ones, I should say, uh, <laughs> as opposed to identifying themselves as liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, all of the ways in which we at this round table here, social scientists who seek to generalize to find a social element that, that unites these people, always uh, different from the labels that we assign. And so again and again, we found people when faced with a personal decision, can I do this to my house in order to become more resilient against excessive flooding or excessive heat? We're willing to act and, and quickly to identify a problem as well as its solution. Whereas when we stepped back with questions like, do you believe in global warming? Or is your, is your state uh, prepared to implement policies Da, 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 da. then it becomes a different question, at least for the people of this state. And so we found again and again that in terms of preparing people to be resilient, uh, that the best approach seemed to be, and this may uh, coincide with Nathan's findings and, and Jason I'd be curious about too, because he's been talking to people uh, individually, the best approach seemed to be to relate to the individual and to relate to that sense of a kind of a libertarian streak that Hoosiers have demonstrated throughout their history since uh, as long ago as the state was founded. Yeah, if I might, oh, sorry, Fred, go ahead. No, go ahead. 
Yeah, if I might, might add to that a little bit. So we had three components to our project. There was the, the lead testing piece, which is, which is really interesting, and I, I hope we get a chance to talk about. But we also ran these uh, community conversations uh, around common readings and films that we had watched together. And then we also have been running uh, ongoing oral histories uh, with, with community members. And what has emerged from, from some of our work is, is a really deep awareness of environmental justice and injustice and um, how that fits into longer patterns of, um, uh, or longer histories here in central Indiana. So um, what we found is when, when folks came together in these conversations and started talking about uh, you know, the, 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 the environment, um, what we tip, what we often talk about in the when we talk about the environment, we talk about things like carbon dioxide um, and and flooding and resilience. But the, the the definitions and the conversations about what environment was became very broad um, because of this deep connection to society. Um, and so, conversations about environment were also conversations about. Um, not just environmental injustice, um, but there were also stories about violence in communities and uh, uh, you know governmental infrastructures, and these things were all tied together with each other. Um, and to talk about one was to talk about the other things. So, so when folks did come together in these conversations, they became very rich conversations about history and 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 community and and neighborhood to some extent. So if, if I can just follow on this theme for one second, although I, 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 I know I don't have a chance of controlling you if you want to follow on a different theme, but, but what do we learn out of this in terms of advancing the, 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 the debate, if you will? I mean, because for some of this, it's not just going to be individual or community action. There may need to be legal or regulatory um, changes. And so at some point, we are going to be in a political arena um, and Eric, you referred to the, you know, the deep libertarian strain among Hoosiers, which I know and I, I think I share, to be perfectly honest. Um, you, you know, what are we, what are we learning anything from this research that would suggest how we might move that political dialogue forward? Or, or are we just learning these occur at two levels, politicals over here and, you know, individual and communities over here? Um. I would say just, I think a relatively short uh, comment, I hope that I hope is helpful is, I think um, some of this work, I think suggests perhaps that we might be to some extent misplacing our efforts if we don't fully understand um, what the barriers are to action. So I think a lot of the efforts, so much of the efforts have been like on focusing on convincing people who don't believe in climate change to believe in climate change. And maybe that's not actually where we should be going. Maybe we should be going on, hey, we already, we're already sort of there. Like most people already believe in climate change. Most people actually support these policies. And maybe we need to actually be focusing our efforts on like, how do we translate this support into, into action? So maybe it's just, we just need a different dialogue about what the barriers are and how we can address them. Okay, that, that again, seems very positive. I'm, I'm oh, as, opposed, oh. as opposed to the hopeless things. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, no problem. I'll, I'll keep my, my sociology training pressed down and I'll limit the hopelessness talk. <laughs> so I'll, I'll follow on, on Nathan and, and say that uh, I, I completely agree. I think, I think uh, Nathan's research, others' research, my research all speaks to the need to change our, our focus and our efforts. Um, if we, I think we're wasting our time if we continue to do research around changing people's views around climate change, in part because lots, not totally wasting our time, but I think our efforts are better served elsewhere, in part because lots of people are already on board, as we've been saying. And I think there's another percentage of, of the adult population that will probably never change their mind on that. And what we're seeing is regardless of that sort of staunch rejection amongst a certain you know set of the public that the the politicians the u.s system is gradually changing uh there's not maybe the admittance of hey we were wrong the scientists were right type thing that like you know we would all find very cathartic in our jobs but we are seeing this movement towards addressing these problems in ways that are accepting, uh, accepting to a bipartisan audience. And I'll, I'll point to a local one that's gone national. 
It's the Growing Climate Solutions Act that was you know, co-written originally by Indiana Republican Senator Mike Braun alongside Michigan Senator Democrat Debbie Stabenow. And that's been extremely successful in terms of gaining support at the federal level for establishing a carbon market that'll pay farmers uh, you know, effectively to offset carbon. Um, that your money, if you buy a plane ticket, for instance, right, and you're trying to offset that price of carbon for flying, instead of going to a forest in Alaska, now can potentially, once the market gets set up, go to a farmer in Indiana and encourage them and pay them directly to plant cover crops, for instance, in their field and be a carbon sink. And this is a way, right, of addressing climate change, dealing with some of our issues that's received bipartisan, it's not only bipartisan support, right, it was written in a bipartisan way. So I think that conversation at the political level is moving along and is focusing on solutions to this topic. So we're seeing change right now. And in my, my new position, I've seen this change also in the private sector with companies that are increasingly shifting where they see the future of the success of their company, particularly in the agribusiness sector, as being around sustainability and resilience and providing those services to farmers and to the communities that are around them. It's, it's funny, I mean, I, I, I would just say, and again, this is not science, this is uh, completely um, um, anecdotal, but when we were first launching this, when Eric and his colleagues were first proposing this, um, you know, one of the things was there was, you know, how were people in Indiana gonna react to Indiana's public flagship university doing environmental change. And so we talked with a lot of people. And to be honest, I don't think we found anyone anywhere who didn't believe in climate change. I mean, farmers, business people, government people, they were all living climate change. They might disagree about what caused it or disagree about whether the government should compel a solution or they disagreed about a lot of things. But literally, I'm trying to think if we found anybody who said, I don't think climate change is real. You know, I just think that's something you all are making up. Um, and so in that sense, Matt, you're absolutely right about how far the debate is, uh, how far the debate has come. Um, I want to go back to my earlier question because um, Jason, I don't know if you got a chance to weigh in on this and um, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure Lizzie, you did, about what you're just seeing in your research that is, that is interesting or surprising or something you want to make sure you get a chance to share today. And Eric, I, I want to make sure we get to you too on this. Sure. Yeah. Um, let me talk about the lead testing kits that, oh. that we've been working on. So um, these kits test for soil. They test the soil, they test the dust and test the water in, in individuals' homes. And the idea is to, to create this database of information so we have a better sense, but also to give people back the lead levels in their homes so they can mitigate those. And a lot of times that's, that's a relatively simple thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, the effects of lead, I think a lot of us know, are, are particularly dangerous for children, um, causes neurological damage, um, it, uh, it limits cognitive development, um, can lead to things like hearing loss, behavioral issues. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. And it's a deeply widespread in the United States. Um, and uh, a lot of, of course, the ways that um, uh, children get exposed to this are, are at home, um, you know, um, you know, lead paint, for example, or, or lead in the soil that they can, they, you know, kids are constantly putting their hands in their mouth, um, and, you know, ingesting lead this way, but also, you know, on the, on the, you know, when they walk into their homes with their shoes on, you know, they might be tracking lead dust into, into the home. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that lead, lead can find their way into people's homes. It's a major public health challenge that we're facing in this country, but a lot of people don't know about it, right? Like, you know, uh, you can ask anybody about climate change and everyone will, as we've, we've seen, has some kind of opinion or, or knowledge about that. But um, the, the knowledge about lead poisoning is kind of generally out there, but it doesn't always seem like a clear and present danger to people. And that's because it's, you know, it's something you don't smell. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily see it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think one of the surprising and the most important things that we walked away with was we can talk about environmental change on big levels and, and, and get people on board with us. 
Um, I think where our next challenge is going to be is in the communication and the education with the public about what some of these specific things are and what needs to be done in order to address them. Um, that may not be necessarily that surprising, um, but it is nevertheless important. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, there has been free lead testing available to people here in Marion County. Now, the question is, why aren't people doing it? I think answer one goes back to the initial thing, which is people aren't necessarily aware of the dangers uh, that it poses. But the second thing is, and this is something we heard a lot from people, which is there was a concern that if they brought a governmental agency into their homes, what if that government agency found um, code violations within their homes? Could they be cited for something? Or if their homes had high rates of lead and uh, their there were children in the homes, what does, does child services get involved in this? And so there is a certain reticence um, uh, broadly in the community that if this, if, if the government, if the, if the city were brought in, what were the ultimate effects for their households? Um, economically, um, uh, you know, for, for, for their children. Um, but since IUPUI was already running this lead testing project um, and it was anonymous, right. um, it became much easier then to convince people then to participate in the project. Um, and it's actually that anonymization uh, that has, uh, I, I think, helped us move forward with this project. It's an ongoing project. Um, but, it, but it has helped us make connections in the community and reach people that we may not necessarily have been able uh, to reach um, with lead testing kits in the past. Great, thank you, very interesting. Um, Lizzie, to you or Eric, um, I, I wanna make sure you don't get passed over in this about what's coming out of your research. Sure, thanks, thanks for asking. I, um, two things come to mind from my work with the Environmental Resilience Institute. Um, I think first, just the surprising ways for me as an environmental historian engaging with contemporary questions of climate justice and climate resilience. Um, uh, my work, you know, the exhibit that I've been talking about that brought new questions about infrastructure for me and obviously the national debate about that. It was, it was a really timely moment for me to, to think through questions of infrastructure, um, but also public housing. Um, I published an article recently about um, East Chicago, Indiana and in the Calumet region of Northwest Indiana, um, lead contamination in public housing and um, just the, in order to understand, you know, contemporary Superfund remediation, we have to look back at this history of urban renewal and how um, the communities were faced these unjust um, removals and, and replacements to contaminated areas. So seeing how all these things come together has been really, um, has, has really changed my approach to research. And again, trying to figure out the connections between rural and urban spaces for me, I think um, that's something that needs to be further examined in the humanities and social sciences um, and something that I'm, I'm working through myself. Um, and then this, the second thing I wanted to mention um, to get back to the question of what we can do to kind of advance the political discussion. Um, I think it takes something like the grand challenge to um, kind of take these bold actions of investing um, for these long-term um, kinds of solutions that we're talking about. And I, I'm thinking specifically about the Educating for Environmental Change program, um, which um, is a collaboration among um, the School of Education at IU and climate scientists and social scientists um, sharing our research and making that available um, for K through 12 professional development and curriculum. And so taking these big questions um, and approaching it from really innovative ways that are understanding that this is a long-term <laughs> um, a long-term timeline that we're working with. I think it's important to understand that we have to be patient with some of these initiatives, um, but also realize the urgency of the moment we're facing now. So that's a challenge to do, but ERI, I think has approached that um, in really interesting ways. Great, thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, I'll um, uh, echo Lizzie and, and others and uh, just say that for me, it was, it was fascinating as a historian, partly to, to kind of revisit 
something that's a touchstone of, of many social science studies, and that is the, the, the Middletown study of Muncie, Indiana in the 1920s. And we very much had Middletown in, a, in the back of our mind when we crafted the Who's Your Life survey that Matt's told you more about. And we were very much aware that, uh, of, of the oddity of the fact that for all that uh, was collected in that town at that time, uh, Muncie in the 1920s and 30s, about the ways in which Americans live and their values and what they think about, there was no effort, uh, virtually none at all, to think about the environmental setting, the environmental cost, the, uh, the use of resources as kind of the basis on which all of those uh, social and political and personal values rested. So it's fascinating that uh, when we come back to doing a social survey in Indiana, we're, we're now faced with a time when you cannot avoid that. Uh, as you said, Fred, it, it's in the air and uh, it's something that everybody's aware of. And we were able to kind of finally pry that out at a more um, explicit level. So it's fascinating to me to think again about the, the very unconservative way in which Hoosier conservatism has evolved over the years. That is to say that the price of our social conservatism, moving cautiously, uh, valuing the individual, uh, maintaining uh, the, uh, the, the free market, the capitalist uh, marketplace and all that, the cost has been uh, very high in terms of the resources, the environment, the, the climatic uh, uh, affordances that we have as a society. And in that case, we've not been conservative at all. And so it really is an interesting uh, dilemma and a problem and a challenge to kind of square the circle in a way to appeal to that uh, enduring and really noble uh, characteristic in the American mindset and, and in uh, the lives of Indiana residents as well. At the same time, building on what, as you said, can only be a, a large scale effort, an operation that requires all of us. It does seem to me based on our findings in the surveys that the way to get to that is through the household, through the individual, through the questions of how can we help you to improve your life and your sense of well-being in the years to come. So I have to say you are like the most upbeat group of people. Whenever I usually talk with scientists from ERI, I'm left kind of depressed about you know global warming and things like this. Um, I bet you will get invited to parties all the time because people just appreciate your optimism and collaboration. But I am interested in the changes that you're seeing in your own disciplines, because it strikes me that many of you have jobs that might not have existed 20 or 25 years ago. I mean, a, an environmental sociologist, an environmental historian. A, a, am I wrong? I mean, this feels like this is evolution even within the academy. Well, uh, Fred, if I might just jump in here, um, you know, I think one of the things that I've seen change uh, to, 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 to kind of uh, reflect what you're saying is this movement towards working together across these disciplines. I, I think that may be even the biggest thing that's changing within, within my discipline, which is, you know, I find myself working regularly with um, geomorphologists and biologists and, you know, chemists. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a historian of 18th century Britain, um, yet somehow I'm working with all of these folks. Um, and I, I can see colleagues across the globe moving in this direction as well. I think we're, we're moving together towards, towards something. Um, and I see that as one of the biggest changes. Well, and even, I mean, you're each within an established field or department, but, you know, would the history department have had somebody who did environmental history 30 years ago? Yeah, certainly the, you know, the, the field, as it were, has been around for uh, okay. a half century and people have been writing what is in effect environmental history for much, much longer than that. But as Jason says, the imperatives of the, the, the obvious good sense 
of, of working both within and across disciplines with that in mind are just so much more present and so much more obvious to us now. And in fact, in this particular case, the Grand Challenge has been key in allowing us to bring in that kind of expertise in history and other social science departments at our faculty level, at the level of postdoctoral researchers like Lizzie and Matt. So it really is uh, a challenge that IU, as much as any other place, I think, is meeting head on. And so what do you see as the future then in the, in the academy? I'm not asking you for the whole future for the world. Is this a, is this, a, is everyone going to have an environmental resilience institute over the next decade? Is this a, a, a type of working that, that that's going to expand or are we going to see? I mean, again, we're living in kind of a funny time in which the political dialogue has somewhat shunned experts. But on the other hand, experts, you know, obviously play a pretty critical role towards helping us figure our way out of this. So, um, and then, Matt, I also want to ask you, when you disappeared, a picture popped up. That was not your picture. <laughs> no, it was my, my, what I personally subjectively think is my very cute four-year-old daughter dressed as a scientist, which she wants to be. Uh, she's much cuter than me. So I figured, why, why look at my face if I'm away? Well, we took a poll and we all agreed she was cute. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that oh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll answer your question very, yeah. very briefly here and say that we as the Environmental Resilient Institute fellows actually recently published a, a paper collectively that addresses some of these topics. Um, the, our point was to sort of discuss our experiences as a, a, a cohort of fellows joining a new institute, what that was like, the, the opportunities, the challenges, um, and, and ultimately just provide lessons for future such endeavors. And some of the work we did in that does suggest that there already are a number of institutes like the Environmental Resilience Institute. No one quite has our particular flavor, and in particular, the degree to which we are place-based and focused on the state and the Midwest generally, I think, really makes the Environmental Resilience Institute stand out, not to mention all the wonderful people that are connected to it, obviously. Um, but this is, this is a, a growing movement within universities broadly because there's a recognized need, as you've said, to look beyond disciplinary boundaries and find ways to A, collaborate, work, work as teams, as, as everyone's mentioned, but I think also to generate knowledge and, and individual capacity to be that systems thinker, to address wicked problems, to be someone that can integrate disciplinary perspectives, not obviously as a, as a do all, but as someone that can see how the pieces fit together in a bigger puzzle and put that together for the increasing demand we see for these collaborative proposals, for instance, by the National Science Foundation, by the USDA, these big government programs, and increasingly also the private sector are demanding interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary proposals and I think we're seeing the rise of centers as a quick reaction to ensure that universities have that capacity. The other thing I'll note, and I think we're all aware of it, is there's a growing number of, of if you want to call them departments, you know, something along those lines, like, like SPIA, like the O'Neill School at IU, that are interdisciplinary of themselves. Right. And so I think we're not only seeing the growth of centers, we're seeing the changing of the university itself. We're seeing the changing of the discipline. And I would argue beyond just being an environmental sociologist and that being a relatively unique thing over the last 50 years or so, it's tough to point and say that you're clearly this type of environmental social scientist over that type. There's a blurring across all of these disciplines and personally, I think that's a wonderful thing because I think that's how we address these problems. Now, there's also a need, as you say, to move beyond a, a, a elitist ivory tower perspective. And I know everyone on this call is already, is already there. We're already thinking this way. And I think it's one of the greatest challenges as a researcher to thinking about how can I include more stakeholder, more public input in my work, not just as an end result to it, but as something that is formative and shapes the, the research project itself. 
I think we're seeing a growing demand for that. We're seeing wonderful approaches. Lizzie does a lot of this. Others across campus do a lot of the participatory research. And that's an area of, of strength, I think, for the Environmental Resilience Institute broadly, and something that um, we all as scholars need to get better at. Thank you very much. We are almost at the end of our hour. So I want to get any final comments you want to squeeze in. This is a great chance to do it. Nathan, Jason, Lizzie, Eric? I'll just, I can just um, add on a little bit briefly to what Matt said. And uh, I don't have quite the, the interdisciplinary experience of Matt, but I, I do have a little bit because I came from a social psych background and I'm now working here at the media school. And I still occasionally go mostly pre-COVID, uh, still went to um, psychology conferences and met up with a lot of other people who also had psychology backgrounds and like ended up in a variety of different fields. So I'm, I work with people who are in public policy, environmental studies, communication, political science. A lot of them came from psychology and they're sort of branching out because, because of the, you know, the awareness that this is such an interdisciplinary issue that you can start in one field and end up in another. And I will also say that um, just my experience of you know, interacting with people in this community is that a lot of the people, I might be a little biased, but a lot of the people that I interact with that I enjoy interacting with, I would say are among like the most, um, what, I, what psychology, psychologists would call intrinsically motivated people. Like they're, they're really doing this because they wanna be doing it and they believe that it's important. So I think that's really great. I always enjoy working with people who are, who are doing something like that and they really just enjoy what they're doing and they, they're, you know, doing this to try to learn more about, you know, humans and how we interact with the environment. So I, I'm really happy to be in this field and to be able to, you know, have gotten to interact with all of, all of you all. Great, and thank you. I'm gonna let that very positive word be the last word, if I may. Um, thank you all very much for being here, all of our panelists. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your work and I appreciate your taking the time today to share it uh, with us. I also wanna take just a moment to um, acknowledge the the directors of ERI, um, um, Eric, you mentioned um, Ellen Ketterson was the founding director who worked with a team of people to get it started. And we're very grateful to her. And she was followed by Janet McCabe, who has gone on to the EPA. So um, I like to think that it was a useful, uh, a useful launching pad for her um, extensive work uh, there. And of course, now Gabe Filippelli and Sarah Mency. And Sarah only had to, um, only had to deal with um, compliments coming in through the Q&A. You did that very, uh, you, you did that very well. And finally, I wanna thank Lisa Fukuda for um, organizing this and for being such an instrumental uh, part of all of our grand challenges. We'll be doing another session just like this, um, um, I, I suspect after the uh, winter holidays coming up. In the meantime, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for joining us. Take care, bye-bye.